to do today is tell you something that I think might change the way you look at the weeds in your garden, the weeds on our roadsides, and even the weeds that we see in our national parks. Now, my story starts over 100 years ago, when people generally thought that introducing plants and animals from different parts of the world to Australia was a really good idea. In fact, they thought it was such a great idea that they'd formed acclimatization societies. And these are, as far as I can tell from the pictures, mostly groups of men with the most amazing whiskers. <laughs> and they work tirelessly to enrich our native uh, fauna and flora. Perhaps my favourite example of the work of the acclimatization societies actually comes from New York, where the American Acclimatization Society decided it would be just lovely if they could get all of the different types of bird species mentioned in Shakespeare's works established in New York's Central Park. That's how whimsical they were. So they did this, and one of them was a roaring success. The <laughs> European starling became a really serious invader. Now, as a result of the actions of the acclimatization societies, but also from introductions for agriculture, for our gardens, and also all those accidental introductions on people's socks and boots over the years, we now have over 3,000 species of introduced plants growing and reproducing happily in Australia. And lots of these have become a really noticeable part of our ecosystem. I'm sure you're all familiar with them, and I'm sure you're also familiar with the fact that introducing them wasn't actually such a good idea on the whole. They, in fact, cost Australia over $4 billion each year. That's partly in lost revenues, but partly in the cost of trying to control them. And perhaps worse than that hit to the hip pocket is what they do to our native biodiversity. Worldwide, introduced species are the second biggest threat to native species, and that's second to just taking a bulldozer and just driving it through your native species. So they're pretty bad. And if you talk to most ecologists or conservationists about weeds, you get an answer that wouldn't sound that out of place from these guys. Now, what I'm going to do today is move a little bit beyond that, because talking about all the downsides of weeds was just not very new, and this is Ted. So what I'm going to do instead is point out that these guys with the whiskers actually set up an amazing replicated experiment for us uh, that can really help us understand evolution. And in particular, what they did was, without realizing it, they followed a near-perfect recipe for creating new species. And what I'm going to argue today is that it is now inevitable that introduced species will, over time, evolve to become new, uniquely Australian species. So before we get to the part where the lantana's in utes and driving around with those Australian flag things on its wing mirrors, um, I have to actually explain how I get to this conclusion. And to do that, I'll start by telling you how new species are usually formed in nature. And I'll do that with this group of bird species. They're finches from the Galapagos Islands, and they are, of course, famous for shaping Charles Darwin's thinking about evolution. So, to make a new species, you start out with a population of your organism, be it birds or snails or plants or whatever, and you end up with that population in two or more geographically isolated patches. That could happen from having one original range that gets divided through things like sea level rise or mountain building episodes, or if your taxon doesn't uh, disperse very well like these birds, you could just end up with them isolated on different islands that they can't move between very easily. However you do it, once you've got them growing in different places, the door is open for them to adapt to the local conditions. And in this case, the important difference for the birds between the islands was about the types of food that were available there. So over the generations, selection acted on the beak form of these birds to make them more efficient at eating the foods that were available to them. Now, at this point, we have uh, populations that look really quite different to one another, but most ecologists won't accept them as new species until you've gone one last step and shown that they actually don't breed well together. 
So you take the individuals from those different populations, put them back together, and you find that they either can't or won't breed to make successful babies. Okay, so that's how it usually happens in nature uh, for making species. And what I'm going to show you is that this is exactly what we have done with our weeds. So first step is to establish geographic isolation. And those guys with the whiskers did that in spades because they've moved these things hundreds or thousands of kilometers around the world. And now that those plants are growing here, they're experiencing different conditions to what they got at home, partly because they're interacting with a whole suite of different plants and animals, so different things pollinating their flowers, different microbes, different things dispersing their seeds or eating their leaves, and a whole flora of different plants for them to compete and coexist with. And that's just the biological environment. There's also the physical environment to consider. And just to take an extreme example, imagine how shocking it would be for a little herb introduced from Scotland arriving in New South Wales. <laughs> so lots of reasons for these to be undergoing selective change. But evolution's a slow thing, right? These things have only been here for 100 and 150 years. Surely we won't have seen anything yet, right? Well, actually, the evolutionary ecologists have been showing more and more lately that evolution can happen much more quickly than Charles Darwin ever imagined. It's not uncommon for it to happen within just a few generations or within a decade or two. So we thought that given the strength of the selective pressures that are on these introduced species, we might actually have already had a chance for these things to adapt to Australian conditions. So we went out to test this, and one of my master's students, Joanna Buswell, uh, went to the nation's herbaria, which are basically libraries full of pressed plants. And as you can see from this plantago, which is 130 years old, uh, they keep very nicely, so you can just go up to these specimens and measure what the plants looked like at different plant times through history. So we did that on a whole bunch of different species, and lo and behold, 70% of the plant species that we measured had undergone significant change since they'd got to Australia. And those weren't just quibbling little statistically significant things that you had to look hard for. These were substantial changes that really affected the way the plants were growing and interacting with their environment. So for instance, this clover that we've got on the screen here, had become 60% shorter every 100 years since it had got here. And just in case you're thinking, oh, well, of course it's shorter here, it's drier here than where it came from, these plants were all growing in New South Wales, so it's not that they're in a different environment through time. That's just them changing since they got here. OK, it wasn't just plant height that changed. We also had species that dramatically changed their leaf size or their leaf shape. So, no doubt about it, our introduced species, our weeds, are adapting to life in Australia. Now, that's got a good news and a bad news aspect to it. The bad news is, oh, holy cow, our introduced species are actually adapting to life in Australia. So they're getting better and better at living here. That means they're getting more and more invasive. So that's hardly good news. There is good news, though. And that is, we measured all these different plants, and they were from a whole bunch of different species, different families. And on the whole, they were remarkably good at adapting to this changed environment that they'd encountered. And I'd like to think that that means that there's this little sliver of hope that our native plants might actually be better able to adapt to the coming climate change than we feared. OK, so back to evolution, we have established geographic isolation, and these plants are already adapting to the conditions in Australia. So we're a long way down this chain towards these things already becoming separate species. The only thing we'd still have to show to prove that they were already separate species is that they can't breed successfully with their source populations. Now, we're actually working on that at the University of New South Wales at the moment, but it's going to take a few years for me to get an answer. But my thesis today isn't that, as of the 26th of May 2012, they're already new species, although I suspect some of them are already. Um, but my, my big point is that 
If things go on like this for enough time, it's inevitable that they will become new species at some point into the future. So the only question really is, are we going to give them that time? And a lot of us would like to think, well, no, we're going to eradicate them, right? Well, people are working really hard on controlling introduced species in Australia, and they're doing a really great job. This stuff's backbreaking work, and a lot of the control programs are really, really benefiting our native species. But the resources that we have for weed control are not infinite. Um, there are whole areas of Australia where there's no control of introduced species going on, and whole lists of species that we're not even trying to control. So they will be here into the future. And even the big bad weeds that we'd really love to see eradicated, the bad news is actually eradicating species from a country as big as Australia is next to impossible. So whether we like it or not, and really we don't, if you come back to Australia in 100 years, 1,000 years, 10,000 years, there will be introduced species here. And if they keep on adapting like they are to our environment, at some point, they will have diff diverged enough from their source population that they will become unique Australian taxa. And that's got some really interesting implications for our management of these weeds. Perhaps my favourite uh, implication is the fact that if they do become unique Australian species, things that only live here in the planet, then at some point we might want to actually turn around in our management of these things and stop actually trying to exterminate them and actually start trying to protect them instead. Now, I know that's not going to be an easy thing for a lot of people to accept. I imagine there's a lot of people sitting there with their arms crossed going, yeah, right, you can say what you like. I am not accepting Lantana as an Australian. Um, and fair enough, I've got uh, three pictures for you, though. This is my son, Sam. He's a second-generation Australian. He was born here, speaks with an Australian accent. Most people would have no trouble in accepting him as Australian. For some reason, we don't extend the same favour to the clover. <laughs> it's been here for 130 generations. This is the one that I showed you as getting shorter through time, so it's growing with an Australian accent, and it's definitely... <laughs> It's definitely part of the Australian environment. Lots of Australian animals eat this stuff for breakfast. But for some reason, we're not accepting this as an Australian yet. Is that because it was introduced here by humans? Well, I don't think so, because our third species is the dingo. And that was introduced here by humans about four or 5,000 years ago. And as long as you're talking about a purebred dingo, most people are pretty happy to accept that as an Australian taxon, even an iconic Australian species. And National Parks and Wildlife Service do spend their time trying to protect those purebred populations. So, will we ever accept introduced species as part of Australia? Yeah, I think like the speciation process itself, it's just a matter of time. And you know what? It might be a bit sooner than you think. Thank you.